Given today's theme, I want to start by not so much asking you to rewrite the rules, but to break them. So can I get everyone to take out your phones? I know you've all got them. And I'm doing it too, so don't, I'm not doing something that I'm designed to get you in trouble. Turn them on. I know you're supposed to have them off, but let's turn them on. And I want you to go to the camera app. Again, I know you all have these. And I'd like you to take a photo. It can be of here, it can be of me, your surrounds. I'm going to take one. Let's see if we can do this right. Beautiful. Photoshop Ellen DeGeneres into that later. <laughs> All right, now what I want you to do is to send it to someone. OK, so send it preferably to someone in another country, if you can. But if you can't, around the corner is just fine. So let's do that. OK, next thing I want you to do, go to your uh, music. And I want you just to uh, pick out a song, just at random. And I'm going to count to three, and I want everyone to play that song. OK, so if we're ready, on the count of three, I hope you've got a song ready. One, two, three. Am I the only one playing? That's slightly embarrassing. OK. All right, we can stop that now. All right. Um, OK, now we'll have to follow the rules and, and turn that off. Those of you who were wondering if that was just a ruse for me to fulfill a lifelong ambition to slow dance to the Pina Colada song in front of a room of people, you were right. All right, what, what I now want you to do is to imagine if I'd asked you to do that 50 years ago. Cast your minds back. Some of you may have been born then, some of you wouldn't have been. But imagine we're 50 years ago, and I say the same thing. Could you please get out your phone? You would think I was a raving lunatic. What? Get out my phone. No, to get out your phone, you have to leave the room, get in your car, drive to your house, go to the room that has the phone in, unplug the phone, get back in your car, come back here, and you've got it, and what do you can do with it? Nothing. It's useful for only maybe throwing at me kind of Russell Crowe style, but that's about it. Could you have taken a photo? Maybe. Maybe you bought your little box brownie with you. Probably not. And if you'd taken a photo, what then? You would have had no idea whether it was a good one or not. And you certainly wouldn't have been sending it to someone across the other side of the world. And yet we can do that now. 50 years ago, this is pure fantasy, and yet we, we can do it and we do it regularly. Playing a song. Can I have everyone play me a song? How would you react to it? How have reacted to that? Same thing. This time I'm going with you back to your house, and we're going to a room that would have a record player in it, and you're pulling the record out, and that's about it. You know, some of you would have 500, 1,000 songs on your phone. You know, 50 years ago, to play that many songs, you have a shelf full of vinyl, and you're certainly not taking it anywhere with you. I mean, it's really, really remarkable how quickly and how rapidly technology is advancing. Now, for those of you who are wondering why there's a rock on the table, it's not a rock. I want you to think about this in the context of your phone. For those of you in the cheap seats who can't see it, um, that's what it looks like. I took that photo with my phone. This is an Arshulian bifacial hand axe. This is uh, um, about a million years old. Roughly a million years ago, someone sat down and made this. It would have been likely used as a butchering implement. I would like that to cut open a carcass. It would have been made by uh, someone who looked a little bit like this. This is one of our Homo erectus ancestors. Should probably point out for those of you who are wondering, our ancestors actually did have bodies. They weren't kind of <laughs> torsoless freaks scurrying around. Now, Erectus have been one of the most successful animals to have ever lived. They were on the planet from around 1.8 million years ago to around 80,000 years ago. Well, what's interesting, among many, many things, is that if you were an Erectus from around 1.8 million years ago, you would have made a hand axe that looked a bit like this. If you were an Erectus who lived around 80, 90,000 years ago, you would have made a hand axe that looked a bit like this. For nearly a million years, and this is considered to be one of the most important technological advances of our, uh, of our ancestors, but for nearly a million years, very little in the way of technological change. And so we can begin to ask this question, why? What is it that's so different about us that in less than 50 years we've gone from something, this is absolute fantasy, all the things that fit into your phone to, to something that's reality. Why were our ancestors so, so very far from doing that? Well, there are a number of, of ways to answer this. 
But very recently, Macliffe and Bjorklund wrote this, and I really like this quote. The origins of human social nature and cognition are found in infancy and childhood, placing social cognitive development at centre stage in understanding the evolution of the human mind. In other words, if we really want to understand the evolution of the human mind, we need to look at children and understand how children engage and see their world and understand the social and cognitive development that goes alongside childhood. In particular, today, I want to point you to something that has been very recently discovered, the ways in which our children learn from us. So I'm going to show you a brief clip. And what I want you to focus on is the way this young boy responds to this task. Now, the task is to get open a box. It's a relatively simple task. But before he's given an opportunity, I show him how I open the box. Because I'm sneaky, before getting the box open, I go through this series of steps. I take a stick and I wipe it across the top of the box. That's a complete waste of time. It was patently obvious it does absolutely nothing. I then take the stick and I use it to poke two dowels out. Now, you have to take the dowels out to get the box open, but using the stick is also kind of making the task unnecessarily difficult. Much better just to use your hand. So what I want you to watch is how he responds when he's given the box and pay particular attention to his right hand. So here we go. One, two, three, and we'll do it a fourth time just for good measure. Right, see his hand go up there? No, he didn't use it. So now he's going to persist in poking out the dowel. No, 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 don't use your hand. Okay, but you can see, he's thinking, I should just use my hand, but he doesn't. Here we go again, pulling out the font. No, 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 no. It'd be much easier just to use his hand, but he doesn't. Okay, he eventually gets it open. Well, what we find is that this is very typical behaviour. That is, children will consistently copy everything they've seen someone do in tasks like this. We've tested this in many places around the world. Um, this is in the middle of the Kalahari Desert, um, and a, a community of Bushmen. Um, children there did exactly the same thing. That is, having seen a demonstration of how to do something, they'll copy everything, even those things that are clearly irrelevant, and even things that they know are irrelevant because they've found out beforehand how to do it. In other words, what we do when we learn from others is we initially, we have this habit of copying everything. Now, that may seem maladaptive, but it can also be very, very useful and enables us to gain the skills very quickly to do a whole range of things. Imagine if everything you did, you had to reinvent every time you did it. The number of skills and behaviour you can learn are suddenly very limited. Think about cooking. Imagine trying to cook a souffle and you just know that a souffle can be made and you have to come up with your own way of doing it. Much better and much easier to copy everything written down in a recipe. Now, you may later find out that some of those things are useless, but if you initially copy everything, you can get that behaviour very quickly. Now, I'd love to be able to show you a video of, of Homo erectus doing this task, but until someone builds me a time machine, I'm not going to be able to do that. What I can show you is what happens when you do this with one of our living relatives. This pinky, she actually ended up that tree. I didn't think I was going to get my box back. Uh, this is um, Putu. He, he's a juvenile male at this point. Now, what you can see is he, he knows there's something inside. He knows the box needs to be opened. Um, but he's going about it kind of his own way. Um, he, he kind of will continue going through a series of trial and error attempts at getting the box open. Now, he, he may or may not take as long as, as the boy I previously showed you. There we go, he's got it open. But what has he learned in this? Well, he's learned that you can get the box open. But if he was like a human and he copied everything that he saw, he'd have the skill quickly and can go on and apply it to any other number of areas. So this is this really valuable skill that we have as humans, and that is that when we learn to do something initially, we have this tendency to copy everything we've seen. It also means that we acquire a whole host, a whole range of cultural products, cultural behaviours, because instead of worrying about whether they're useful, we just copy them. And a lot of cultural behaviours aren't functionally useful. Now, there are some other things. There are, of course, a lot, 
I'm just going through a few today. The second one is large population size. So if we want to create technology and to have it move rapidly, we need a reasonably large population. If you imagine that um, this room here is our population, and the people in the front row are experts at something, people in the second row are innovators, people who will break the rules and come up with new ways of doing things and drive us forward. Well, if instead of it being the whole room, we're just going to limit to this row straight ahead, and there's a catastrophic event, and the first two people are dead. I'm sorry to have just killed you off like that, but that's life. We've lost our expert, we've lost our innovator, and the rest of us are left floundering. Now, there are ample examples of that in the historical record where that's happened, where there's small population size, a catastrophic event hits, and whole skills are lost completely. But of course, if we've got a big population size, I'm going to kill you two off again. Again, I apologize. We still have experts. We still have innovators. And so large population sizes kind of act as a, a prophylactic against loss of skill. If you imagine also that there are a lot more people who are experts, there's a lot more people to learn from. There's a lot more ideas floating around. We have more innovators. And so when we get a large enough population, suddenly we have this capacity. If you keep in mind that we've now got this, this ability for quickly learning things, but then we can pass them on. There are more people to learn from, more people to pass them on to. And so our capacity for innovating grows and our technology grows. Well, if we want to increase population size, this can be achieved by ensuring mothers have reliable sources of help to take care of their children. One of the things that makes us humans is that we have a long childhood, and when we're young, we're dependent on others for our care. So how can we ensure that mothers have assistance with caring for their children. Well, there's another quirk of human life history which marks us as different from other animals. Now, if we compare us to chimpanzees, we have slightly longer infancy period, slightly longer juvenile period, adulthood period, ours is, well, depending on where you carve it up, could be a little bit less. But what I'm going to put on here now is the reproductive period. And for chimpanzees and humans, it's roughly the same. Now, for chimpanzees and humans, roughly at around 40 years of age, reproduction ceases. Now, in chimpanzees, shortly after that, they die. But in humans, that doesn't happen. In fact, in humans, post-reproductive period, life goes on for quite some time. Now, why is this useful? Well, firstly, this signifies the emergence of grandma. Now, what does grandma do? Well, grandma helps look after her grandchildren. There are, again, a number of strands of evidence that show that having a grandmother present, in some cases, can double the chances of more children being born. So when we have grandma around to help her daughters take care of her daughter's children, her daughter is more likely to have more children. Grandmothers and grandparents in general also provide a repository of wisdom. They have skills and ideas and they have a history that they can pass on. So we have a retention of all the ideas that we have accumulated in our culture. And so Hawks and colleagues have written this. Anatomically modern sapiens may have enjoyed unprecedented ecological and competitive success because they had what other earlier hominids lacked. Long postmenopausal lifespans and the associated population dynamics underwritten by grandmothers. So, this is kind of how it works. So, the way we learn from mothers enables the rapid transmission of important skills from generation to generation. This is what we see when our children are learning things from us. This is what we saw in the clip before with the young boy who learned to open the box, included a whole range of useless acts, but the mechanisms permit this capacity we have for passing on skills from generation to generation. Postmenopausal women become a reliable source of care for their grandchildren. That means more children can be born, this increases population size. When we increase population size, expertise is less likely to be lost, more models to copy are available, and more rule breakers are able to develop new innovations. So, Next time you pull out your phone, I want you to just pause for a few seconds 
marvel at the amazing capacity we have for advancing technology very, very quickly, for going from something that was just fantasy 50 years ago to something that is very, very real now. And then pause for another second and say, thanks, Grandma. Thank you. <laughs>